Thank you. Um, so we're going to start with a little bit of a practical arrangement, because this will not be the usual uh, 45 minutes of PowerPoint while you digest uh, lunch. <laughs> we intend to do a bit of an exercise. So if you can regroup so you are, at, so you are free at each table. That would be, so if you're already two or if you're already free, you're fine, but it would be great if we could have free. And if, the, if it doesn't sort of add up, then we just need to be a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fine if you're four, that's, that's, uh, that's not a problem. Cool. Uh, you're, you're not part of the game. All right. But then let me, uh, let me kick it off by welcoming to this uh, session around game theory and predictive uh, pricing. Uh, we'll start out with a little bit of introduction about ourselves. I'm Jakob. Um, I spent about 20 years in procurement, uh, working most of the time for a shipping company called Maersk, based out of uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, about a year ago, I founded uh, Moneyball CPH, which is uh, an advisory uh, within digital procurement that has a special focus on sourcing and negotiation solutions. I'm also the author of a book called A Practical Guide to e auction Procurement, which is based on that practical experience of running a little more than 10,000 auctions. Damien. And uh, I'm the nerd in the equation. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. Go blue, if you're familiar with it. Um, all right. And I, I've been there close to 20 years. I teach, believe it or not, strategic sourcing to MBAs and supply chain students. I'm really excited to be with you all today. Great. All right. Let me just run through the agenda here. So we'll start out by doing a bidding exercise. And that's where uh, you'll have to play your part as well. And don't worry, we won't make anybody dance, even though we want to make it very uh, interactive. <laughs> we'll then discuss a little bit around the, uh, uh, the findings of the exercise uh, before we then go into predictive pricing and a discussion with you guys around what kind of difference does it make for a bidding process. And then we'll all wrap up here in about 45 minutes. As said, today's session will be very interactive, so we won't do the traditional uh, approach to it. It's, um, we'll, we'll try to sort of co-create a small experience uh, with you guys today. And the purpose of the exercise is, of course, for you guys to interact with each other, but it's also to sort of develop some experience and learnings from the exercise around what happens in a bidding process and how can predictive pricing uh, uh, help out in a case like that. Don't hesitate to ask uh, questions as we go along. Um, you're more than welcome to interrupt and also uh, raise your hand and, and involve us. Damien. So the bidding exercise that Jakob and I have in mind is kind of based on a very generic setting. We've kind of intentionally kept it, uh, you know, in terms of widgets so that it doesn't trigger any particular cues that you might have from your various industrial contexts. The idea is that the buyer which is, wishes to pr procure some widgets. They've invited two qualified vendors who are going to bid in terms of per unit pricing on these widgets. And the buyer intends to run a simple sealed bid first price auction. The buyer will announce a reserve price that will cap the amount that they're willing to entertain as a per unit price. And the winning um, bid will be whoever is the low bid as long as they meet that reserve price. Each supplier is going to submit a bid on a sheet of paper and hand it to the buyer. And the buyer is going to then you know, pick the winner. Of course, as a supplier, your objective is to maximize profit, keeping it really you know, simple in terms of the, the higher you bid, the higher margin you would get, but the lower the probability of winning if you um, submit a high bid. So Jakob is going to um, circulate around the room and hand out little sheets of paper that describe the information that you have for the different roles of buyer and supplier one and supplier two. We'll let you all kind of digest those uh, roles. <clears throat> and the buyer will be responsible for announcing the reserve price to the two suppliers. 
and we want to give the suppliers a bit of time to think about how they would like to bid. And just so the buyers know, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the auction, we're going to ask the buyers to tell us what was the clearing price, so what was the final winning bid, and which supplier was the winner. <clears throat> Are there any questions before you kind of dive into your instructions? Pretty clear? OK. Pardon? Sure. And don't share your secret information with anybody else. These are uh, top secret sheets of paper here. So we're going to give the suppliers four minutes to decide their bid. <laughs> we'll ha we're going to we're going to give um, an extra thirty seconds for the NDA. Yeah, we, we can give them a couple minutes now. <coughs> okay. Thank you, sir. We've got about two more minutes. <clears throat> when, when you're ready with your bits, you can also uh, raise your hand because no need to wait if everybody is, is done. You're done. Hey, you, you. OK, that's the bits. <laughs> so if the buyer has, once the buyer has the, the winner identified, and the price. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Whatever. And then hand it in to the buyer so the buyer can identify the winner. I win. You won? You guys are done? You're done? You're done. Good. I think we're all uh, okay. Awesome. Anybody not done? Okay, we got some uh, very considerate suppliers over here. I guess they're calculating on the cost model. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll give you guys another thirty seconds. But we can also we can should we. Start over here or? Sure. All right. So what we're going to do is ask the buyer to determine or to tell us who, who uh, what was the winning bid and who won. So we'll start over here. 
$12? Supplier one, okay. 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 All right. Okay. Thirteen fifty. <laughs> wow. <laughs> A little suspicious. <laughs> in the in the back. Yeah. Okay. Twelve dollars supplier one. Did I miss anybody? Okay. What do you notice about the different bids that we collected, or different ending prices? What are some observations? They're, they're different. It looks like the S1 won the most. Yeah. And they were, they were clearly willing to bid 12. Yeah, actually S1 was the low uh, cost vendor. Bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> what about S2? How, how, supplier one didn't always win though. What do you think was going on there? Uncertainty. S2 had a better service, better salesperson. <laughs> well, what does salesperson need to do when deciding the bid? What does what kind of what goes through the salesperson's head when you were sitting there? Yeah. Right. A lot of suppliers seem to have bid 12, which was your walk away bid, I believe, right? Which wouldn't leave you with a whole lot of margin to play with. So instead, trying to find a maximal acceptable bid, meaning as bid as high as you can without losing the contract, right? To the supplier, to the opponent, op opposing supplier. What goes into that calculus? What do you have to think about to, to successfully do that? What do you need? The, the comp plan of the, of the opponent? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You need to understand what goes into your pricing and also have some level of market intelligence to be able to drive what line you have to price it. Mm-hmm. Uh and it's just gonna be a guess. You don't know what the competitor's price is going to be, but you're going to try to make an educated guess. Okay? Anything else? So, when I came to my bid price, I knew I could get it for $11. I had a customer for $11. So I wanted to go slightly higher because high risk, high reward. So I, want, I took the risk instead of going 13, I went straight to 14. I said, I'll have three more dollars to play with. So, Mm -hmm. I guess that's a, that's a really important key point with different risk profiles, right? Do you play it safe or do you uh, high risk, uh, high reward kind of? It, and that's, uh, that's different, of course.
And what do you guys make of the fact that we've got a lot of smart people in the room, we've got a lot of different bits? What does that tell you? Tolerance for risk can vary across individuals, for sure. Yeah. So it, it also tells us something about this, and I don't know whether that was part of your considerations around this winner's curse when we do talk game theory. So the risk of bidding uh, too low, and then uh, because you don't know the competitive situation, of course. That's also uh, something that would influence the way you decide to, uh, to price the, uh, the item here. Are you guys familiar with the concept of winner's curse? Raise your hand if you have heard of it. Okay, some of you. So maybe we should quickly do a discussion about what that is. Um, yep. We could use this as an example of an item we were going to auction off. I'm going to auction off my wallet. And if you win the auction, you get to walk away with however much cash was in my wallet. So, if you were bitter, you got to try to guess how much I like using cash and how much I like using credit cards. How rich I am. And look how thin this is. You know, you're probably, you got a good prior already that I'm not walking around with a big wad of cash. Now, the term winner's curse might kind of suggest that there's some problem or, or some challenges that our bidder would face when bidding for my wallet in this room. What do you think it is? And maybe somebody that's familiar with the concept. Yeah. I mean, raise your hand if you think I have at least $5 in here. Raise your hand if you think I have $10. You know you're professional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I have at least $10. What about 50 Raise your hand if you think I have 50 Raise your hand if you think I have 100 Okay, so you guys would have probably been the winners of the auction. You know how much I have in here? I've got... Five dollars and ones. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the curse of winning because you were the one who were the most optimistic about my proclivity to cash, have cash in my wallet. So, Jakob, how does that translate to kind of differences in bids or risks or yeah, when you so, think about that? So, it, it, when you talk about winner's curse and in a process like this, it's, it's this fear of overbidding. So, you want to make sure to yourself that if I win, the auction of the wallet, at least it's a good deal for me. And that's why what bidders do in a process like that is that they'll come up with a bid, then they'll add a risk premium to protect themselves from being hit by winner's curse. Maybe there are things they haven't considered. You know, he's from Michigan. Maybe he hasn't lived there all his life. So there are other things. So to protect ourselves, we add a risk premium. And that happens every day when you send out RFQs to suppliers if you ask them to take place in these kind of sealed bits uh, uh, processes. A, a risk premium is added to protect the individual for being hit by winner's curse, which is this fear of overbidding or of, yeah, of bidding too high. It's a, it's a very well-known theory and, uh, you know, in, in 2020, um, two uh, American game theorists were uh, awarded with the Nobel Prize in Economics for uh, their research within this uh, field of the impact of, uh, of something like winner's curse to bid processes. Okay. So that takes us to just trying to collect what are some challenges when it comes to arriving at a bid if you're a supplier? And some of this was alluded to in, in the morning's discussions, but I just want to kind of jot them down quickly. And we can think about both in today's exercise and what about in real life. So 
Um, I think somebody, somebody already mentioned trying to like think about the competition, right? How how high are they or how low are they going to bid? That's a that's a major challenge. Um, we talked about risk versus reward. All right. Do those also apply to real life? Yeah. What else happens in real life that maybe we didn't capture in the simple? Yeah. So C TCO kind of, yep. All right, yeah. Explaining winner's curse, I thought the winner's curse might be that I want the business, and I say I want it for what's going on. And then another opportunity comes my way that I can't go after because I bought used all my capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is a form of winner's curse because everybody who's bidding is estimating what the future opportunities could be, and to some extent, those are correlated. We're in the same industry. And, th and that's actually a, a very important part of the winner's curse as well. The way you assign a value to it, especially if you're a new supplier, have I considered all elements? How difficult is it to enter into this relationship? Are there things that I have overseen? Uh, and that's why, again, they would add to the risk premium. So for newer suppliers, they would have a tendency to have a higher risk premium than incumbents because they at least have a, a better understanding of the of the actual setup that they are going into. And incumbents uh, usually, if they bid high on something, know that you might come back to them for improvement because you don't want to go through the change. Mm. They, they act that way. Yeah, and that also kind of gets to the preference of the uh, um, appetite for switching, right? But I guess a key point across all these things is this element of uncertainty. That you don't really know, uh, are there alternatives? Have I considered it all with my own bit? And that uncertainty has a strong impact on the, on the way you price an item. Was there a comment down there? Yeah, I was going to say, sometimes you don't know the capacity of the competitor. If they have open capacity, uh, they may take a little margin just to fill the time. Mm -hmm. Again, another uncertainty where you, don't, you simply don't know in a, in a process like this, where you just hand in a bit, and then you are, you're told whether you want it or not. There's one more thing that kind of came up this morning, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. When you went through the process of determining your bid, was it easy? Was it obvious right away what you were going to do? Or do you have to think a little bit? Had to think a little bit? So if you put yourself in a supplier's position, and I think um, it was mentioned that you might be in automotive and you're getting eight to 10 bids for every single item you're quoting out, and by the way, you don't even know if you're gonna win the OEM's business that you're quoting out. Implications, are there implications for the supplier in that situation when it comes to basically the challenges of coming up with a good bid? Imagine that I gave you not just one thing to bid, but 10, and you had an hour to do it. Yeah, trying to come up with the bandwidth to actually put together a meaningful bid is challenging. And so what you might do if you're 
a supplier is maybe just bid really high and hope that you didn't make, you bid high enough that you covered yourself, right? Just to stay on the list. Or maybe you don't even respond. All right, so let's pivot to predictive pricing as a concept, okay? I'm gonna go back to our data output and I'm going to, oops, I'm going to try to basically create a histogram of our different bids. We had a bunch of bids at 12, two at 12. Three, three 12s. Three 12s. Let me go. We had three 12s, so I'm just gonna put some X marks because we got some 12s. I think we had a, we had a couple 13s, a couple 13.5s, I think we had a 14. Did we have a 15? I think we had a 15. We had three 13s. Okay. Actually, guys, the, the bids that we generated are data. And we had, I don't know, 10 auctions that we just ran, and we got 10 clearing prices for those auctions. But, you know, conceivably, we could have had others in our data. And we could create, basically, a distribution. Now, what could you do with that historical distribution? We're gonna talk about one potential approach that you could use, and I, this is just sort of a hypothetical, just to get our gears turning and have a discussion about but how this might work. So think about it, in a traditional setting, you identify your suppliers, you get initial quotes, you run a competitive bid, you pick a winner. That's kind of what we did today. We didn't run this initial quote setting. How about a possible, there's many other approaches you could use prediction in, but what about this as a possible approach? Identify a supplier. The, supp the buyer is going to suggest a price based on some bid simulation. What does that mean? You go back to this distribution and you pick something from that distribution, okay? And you say, hey, supplier, here's a recommended bid. Um, if the supplier accepts, they're awarded the contract and we're done. Otherwise, we're gonna identify more suppliers and repeat the process. We get a new supplier, we, we suggest a, a price to them, so on and so forth. If all suppliers reject, then you know, maybe we're just gonna run a traditional competitive auction and pick a winner. So first of all, before we go any further, are there any questions about how this setup would work? Is the setup clear? Okay. Then what Jacob and, I, Jacob and I would really like to hear from you is what do you see as the pros and cons of this type of approach from both the supplier perspective and the buyer perspective? If you were to use this approach of suggesting a price to a supplier. So to kind of get you thinking, why don't we give you a minute or two to discuss at your table from each perspective, supplier and buyer, what you think of as pros and cons that might occur to you. Does that make sense? Okay, talk amongst yourselves.
minutes for questions. Okay, I'll give you maybe 30 more seconds. So let's go around the room and hear what you what came up with as pros and cons from different perspectives. Anybody want to kick us off? Yeah. Um, we were talking about from a supplier perspective, when it comes to suggesting a price, you almost transfer a lot of the doubts that you had on a supplier perspective to a buyer saying, I'm going to come in with this price. Am I overshooting? Were they willing to be lower than now I've kind of laid this price out in front of them and potentially not received as big a cost savings as I can potentially get. So that's kind of the first one that kind of came to our minds around a, a potential um, buyer con. Buyer con, okay. So basically, yeah. leave money on the table? Right. Yeah. Potentially, you know, yeah. short change or cost savings. Ours was the same. Yeah. But on the opposite side of that, it was we've done our research, we've, we've had the data in front of us, so from a pro perspective, we know that this is a fair price. We know that we are still saving money with this, and we're telling the supplier, we have the data to back this up. This is where we need to be. So it, it's kind of, depending on your perspective for it, mm -hmm. and how risk averse you are, you know, there are pros and cons both ways there. Is there benefit to having data to point to? Absolutely. Okay. And Quicker turnaround? Yes. Okay. And mm -hmm. Related to the services a little bit more. The, it's not like a fixed cost to perform the service. Mm. So, for example, two different suppliers. Um, you know, one supplier, for example, might have been in the service industry for 50 years and has a strong reputation to pay for it. For her, it's higher than the insurance. Mm-hmm. doesn't come through. Okay, so kind of, are we really looking at TCO, total cost of ownership here, maybe? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I'd, just a comment on, because before we talked about this winner's curse and the risk premium, which is a problem in a, in a not so transparent bid process, like a sealed bid is, the way to get around a winner's curse is through a concept called a common value where bidders learn about each other's uh, way of pricing. So when they get the comfort that others are pricing it at a certain level, they get the comfort to also reduce their risk premium. That's one of the benefits of reverse auctions, that bidders, they get comfortable of lower uh, the price because they can see real time that others are willing to go lower as well. 
you don't get that quite here, but still you actually get kind of common value because as a supplier, you know that there's a data model behind this that is coming up with the suggestion. So it's not taken out of thin air and that could give them the comfort to accept it as well because they know it's based on, on a number of uh, data points. I wouldn't call it common value, I'd call it a, a pseudo common value kind of thing, but it's definitely, I think, a benefit both for the supplier side because they get the comfort of the bid, uh, but also from the, for the buyer side, of course, because it increases the likelihood of suppliers to accept the price if they trust in the uh, price suggestion uh, engine. Yes. And sometimes we just don't bother responding to an RFP because we just don't have the time to deal with it. So if it's pre populated and it's a suggested price, that signals to us that there is a strong intent to purchase. And um, you know, then our risk premium, as you call it, is okay, these guys are not fishing. They're just they're, they're really good to purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially, and we talked a lot about that this morning, if the price suggested, you know, is not completely ridiculous. So it's not like a and a good old haggling on the market where you start this far apart, but it's actually okay, it might be on the low side, but it's realistic. So if you can build up that credibility in how you suggest those prices, as you said, uh, the likelihood that you would respond is a lot higher. And that's where this becomes a benefit for both the buyer as well as the supplier. Other pros and cons? Yeah. Hmm. Even if you don't win the bid, you know out there that maybe they're charging fifteen dollars and my product is twenty or twenty five. Yeah. I think another another point by the way is what we also talked about this morning is this concept about anchoring. So anchoring is a, a, a cognitive bias where we sort of create the, the frame of reference for the discussion. So we open up and then we, we discuss 12, or you consider 12, it's not 18, it's our starting point, which is the reference point for the discussion uh, of the bit. And I think that's a huge benefit for the buyer side. And that's actually the beauty of a process like this, because we just heard from the supplier that it actually, it, it signals that you're serious about it, but at the same time from a buyer, you're putting yourself in a better position. So it is, it is one of those where it's a, a true win-win, actually. Yes. But, but uh, it's a hundred percent that they would be inclined to submit a higher. But there's actually um, empirical research done on this, where you've done transparent bid processes versus sealed bid, and the difference is 9.6 percent in that uh, in that piece of research. So on average, you would submit a bid that is 9.6 percent higher because of the reduced transparency and the risk premium that you risk premium, uh, etc. Yeah. I want to make sure that, yeah, we're getting everybody's comments. One thing that somebody mentioned was less doubt here. I was curious how you think about this when the price evolves from a prediction, it would evolve from this sort of distribution. And maybe the buyer says, hey, I'm going to pick the 25th percentile, and that's going to be what I suggest. Versus the price arising from a competitive outcome that we actually ran. Any pros or cons that you would see? Maybe put yourself in the shoes of a, of a supplier. 
if you won the auction at a bit of, I don't know, let's say you, you won the auction at a bit of 13 and you're happy. You take that to your CFO and say, hey, this is what happened. This is, this is how much margin we're going to get. How would that compare if you said, hey, they suggested a price of 13 and I took it. I didn't come up with 13, it was suggested to me. Do you have any intuition about whether or not that's an easier or harder discussion? A harder sell initially. Yeah, why did you just take it? Right away, and there's no risk. I'll let suppliers don't want to show their hand, right? Mm hmm And it's responsible for coming up and calculating like the cost of capital. So they don't want to get that calculation wrong. So when the buyer presented it, they're off the hook of it. Mm-hmm. They can lean on, hey, look, this is what they offer. So you take it or leave it, I took it. We were gonna make a positive margin, so we're gonna move on. Yeah. Okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. So if you go back to this is the this is the buyer. Yeah. Right, the supplier ought to have that same name on their side that says for the last year this is what I've sold. All right, I have a kind of net distribution where I buy and have that argument to make my case to the CFO. Yeah. Unless, I suppose, you're a supplier who hasn't bid for this contract before. Yeah. And then we're, we're into the, you know, the possibility that, we're, that we trust the buyer and they're going to be transparent with us. And we know, of course, that they're not going to quote, they're not going to offer a price up there. They're probably going to be aggressive and offer something on, you know, the lower percentiles, 25th maybe. But... It's probably not just coming out of thin air. Okay. Um, we've wrapping got, up. Yeah, wrapping up. <laughs> How much time do we have left? One minute. One minute. <laughs> so th these are the lessons that Jacob and I wanted to kind of leave with you all today. So coming up with a bid is hard, and you are, are all smart people, and we, yet you came up with different bids, and that's totally expected. And it's compound, that challenge of coming up a bid is compounded by a lot of things that happen in reality. We gave you just one example of a use case for using predictive pricing, but there's many, many more. Don't, don't walk away from this being like, oh, this is exactly how you, you would use predictive pricing. But we just hope to stimulate some of your thinking around the strategic aspects of coming up with a bid, and then the strategic implications of using predictive pricing. This is the game theory element of these concepts. So hope you got something out of it. Yeah. And Jacob has yeah, a, as a final note. Um, if any of you have an interest in this field of game theory, how it impacts, um, Orchestro has kindly uh, sponsored a number of copies of my book on this uh, subject. So you can pick one as you leave out, they'll hand it out uh, to you as you leave the room. But with that, we just want to say thanks a lot for coming and uh, wish you a good conference ahead. Yes.